So we are very excited to be hosting Samita Mukhopadhyay today. Um, <clears throat> she's generously agreed to join us and, and talk about her work. She's a journalist and really a media maker who writes about the politics of culture, if I can describe it broadly. She's executive editor at Teen Vogue. She's the author of the book, Outdated, Why Dating is Ruining Your Life, and editor of an essay collection entitled Nasty Women, Resistance and Revolution in Trump's America. She's currently at work on a new book, which we might hear, hear about, and someone who's very engaged with topics that will resonate with our community. Feminism, activism, dating, inclusivity, social media and technology, fashion, music. She writes about it all. So welcome, Samita. We're, we're very happy that you're here today. Thank you. That was such a, such a generous introduction. <laughs> really, thank you. I'm going to start off with a question or two, and then I'm going to turn things over to Johnny Sullivan, who, who's the editor-in-chief of our newspaper, The Night News. My first question is about Teen Vogue. Um, if you scroll through Teen Vogue, you'll find articles about slippers alongside others about climate change, right? You'll find articles about Trans Joy, Lizzo's fashion line, the latest on Netflix, fashion at the Oscars, Black organizers in Atlanta, the youngest astronaut trainee in history, right? It's a huge variety. It would be hard to overstate the magazine's influence. I'm curious about how you would describe the magazine's mission and maybe even more curious about how you all talk about that mission on the inside. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so I also, um, I, you know, I left Teen Vogue about a year ago. So I've been um, kind of on the outside cheering them on, um, but I was there for three years and I got there, as you mentioned, at a time when, um, there was, you know, and I, I really, I, I think of the 2010s as a decade of youth uprising and youth organizing. Mm -hmm. And part of it was in resistance to Trump, but some of it started before that, right? If you think back to Occupy, if you think back to Malala, if you think back to Slut Walk, um, the Me Too movement, you had these kind of several really exciting moments, I think, throughout the decade. And one of the things we realized was that young women in particular were not being catered to in terms of the actual full breadth of the politics that they're interested in. And, and, and I would say that our readership, while predominantly uh, women identified, it's not just women, right? It's a lot of young men, it's a lot of queer non-binary um, youth that don't really have a source for their politics or an outlet that speaks specifically to their needs, to the to politics that they're interested in. And so there was a tremendous opportunity at Teen Vogue. And the person who actually hired me, Philip Picardi, who was the chief content officer at the time, you know, he was a little experimental and he saw this happening online. And so he started publishing articles about Trump, like really crit critical um, articles about Trump. And so we started to get a lot of attention. Everyone's like, oh my God, even Teen Vogue is woke. It's 2016 and even Teen Vogue is woke. Um, and so we realized there was a tremendous momentum. And within a month of me arriving at Teen Vogue, uh, Parkland happened, if you remember. And that was the uh, mass shooting at the high school in Florida. And you had Emma Gonzalez and her kind of cohort of young people that ended up on the national stage. And, you know, these young people have tremendous kind of intersectional political analysis. They were able to connect power. They were able to connect privilege to this kind of issue that has become um, you know, seen as a kind of suburban issue. And they were able to kind of build relationships in this really profound way. And so Teen Vogue was really well positioned to give them a platform to kind of speak to this new generation. And so we've just been able to have the privilege. I mean, I always say like Teen Vogue is incredible. Yes, I'm so proud of the work we did there, but it is truly a reflection of the young people. And to me, it's young people that are incredible and their ability to kind of articulate politics in a way that, you know, in my generation, we read about, right? Like we were like, you know, it's, it's, it's like we had hoped a lot, a lot of these kind of ideas and philosophies were in theory, but they weren't actually in practice. And I'm so profoundly impressed by kind of, you know, older teens or people in their early twenties right now that have been able to really um, make a lot of these ideas come to life, so. Yeah, amazing. Um, just a quick follow-up, how much did the day-to-day -day work of producing the magazine change with the change toward a more political vision? So one of it was that we needed to hire a new team, right? So we okay. needed to hire, and, and that was part of why I was brought in, was to kind of build up our journalism. So, you know, there was a lot of interest, and, and 
all of the teams that I kind of overlapped with at Teen Vogue were phenomenal. I think young journalists right now are so impressive and so phenomenal. Um, but there was kind of, we needed, we needed to build out certain capacities that Teen Vogue didn't have. For example, here's like a weird example. So we didn't have like a really rigorous fact checking team, right? Because fact checking beauty products is different than fact checking our take on Israel, Palestine. <laughs> like you need a different set of skills for something like that. So a big part of my job was capacity building and bringing in the right people. And also, you know, internally, you know, we're in this huge, organization, Condé Nast, that has a lot of serious publications in it. And we are, I, I was there demanding and advocating for the same resources that other big publications were getting in terms of journalism, because we were trying to do some serious journalism. And I think, you know, getting people to believe that Teen Vogue is serious, getting people to believe that teen girls are serious, it was a job in and of itself. And so that, that was a big part of the day to day. Um, but I will say that, um, this like little known media executive who stood above us, Anna Wintour, um, was in unbelievably supportive. <laughs> she was very supportive of Teen Vogue being voicey and being political. Um, mm -hmm. You know, she's a bit of a politics buff herself. Um, and so I think that was one of the really nice things about it was that we actually did have quite a bit of internal momentum and support um, to kind of build it out to, to, to the vision that we had for it, so. Cool. Great, thank you so much, Jason. Um, Again, thank you so much, Samita, for being here. Um, so my question is that you've been editor, you've been executive editor and editorial director at a number of publications. And I'm wondering, does your leadership style vary from newsroom to newsroom? And if so, how do you, how do you, do, what are the parameters that help you decide how to conduct a newsroom? So I think it's interesting because I, I kind of had to learn in real time how to lead a newsroom because I was leading a newsroom during the election of Donald Trump, which was unprecedented. And so many of the kind of traditional ideas we have about objectivity, which I think we all know is not a real thing, right? It is something that is often told to women and people of color or anyone that wants to kind of elevate dif disenfranchised stories that is a, is a kind of invisible standard that we have to be held to, but everybody brings their biases to their work. And I think that, you know, kind of figuring out, it, it was probably one of the hardest moments of my life was leading a newsroom that was extremely diverse and absolutely emotionally devastated by the results of the 2016 election. Um, and, and I felt like I was growing up in real time as to the kind of leader I was. And I think prior to that, I was a little bit more traditional in terms of, what I felt was appropriate for opinion writing, what I felt was, you know, and I'm somebody who has always been interested in social justice and elevating those stories, but I think there's a lot of pressure put on um, journalists that cover certain topics to be seen as fair as possible. And, and I think we now know that's often an unfair pressure. Um, and so, but I think that was the first time when I realized that there's no way to separate what emotionally my team was going through with what was happening in the news. And one of the biggest learnings I've had in terms of being an editorial leader is letting people have their feelings, letting people be emotional and allowing them to channel that emotion into their work in productive ways. Um, and so, you know, in for when I was at Mike, where I was the editorial director, and that's when Trump became president, I just realized that everybody was going through this really emotional moment and to just let people run with it and let them, you know, not force people to try and cover it in this kind of fake objective way. <laughs> that, and, and I think a lot of newsrooms were struggling with that because they were just like, how did this happen? We were, nobody was ready. Nobody was ready for what was to come. Um, and so I think that's one piece of it. I think the other is, um, you know, I just fundamentally believe that the best leaders are the ones that elevate their workers, not their bosses. And so I think that um, one of the reasons I kind of had to leave management a little bit was this constant pressure from this like sandwich effect that happens, I think, when you want to be a leader that elevates, I don't know if anybody saw Condé Nast unionized yesterday very happy for them. Um, if I was working there, that would have been very challenging for me, <laughs> so, you know, because I'm middle management. So, you know, it's, it's kind of like, I think with um, the exploitation of the digital workforce right now, management has become a very challenging thing um, because young people are not getting the resources they need and they're not getting the support they need. And they, they, you know, like what happened at Buzzfeed this week or two weeks ago, where they tried to lay off a lot of the team and the investors wanted to, but they're unionized, so they couldn't. But had that been a year ago or two years ago when they didn't have the union, they would have all been fired. And so I think that 
right now is just a really tricky time as, as much as I want to have an optimistic view of at least the management layer of work in kind of editorial direction. Um, it has become increasingly challenging, I think, in this kind of economic system, though the economic systems that current media outlets are working in to be a truly effective and ethical manager. I don't know if that answers your question. Bit of a tirade, but yes, unions. No, that, that was great. Um, so then I'm wondering, was this sort of emotional catharsis you were encouraging around the time of the 2016 election? Was this like a special provision that you that that you made in this, that unique circumstance, or is that something you've tried to bring to all your newsrooms? Um, it's something I've tried to bring to all my newsrooms. I think that one, you know, so before I did any kind of any of these places, I used to work at a place called, and work is an exaggeration because it was a uh, volunteer run collective called Feministing, um, which was a very popular blog in the, God, it was so long ago, uh, the early 2000s. Um, and it was, you know, part of it was a reaction to a media you know, landscape that was failing to effectively cover the issues of disenfranchised communities. And so our interest was really elevating the voices of young women in particular, because at that point, you know, if you read the front page of Time magazine, feminism was dead and like young women were not interested in it. And we were all graduating as, you know, I graduated in 2000 with a women's studies undergrad. And I was like, oh, hear us roar, like we are here. Um, and so, you know, in the kind of, balance of emotion, passion, and social justice and journalism has just always been my work and my interest and helping people cultivate that passion and figure out a way to kind of make that their storytelling. I think that is the most effective storytelling. Um, I'm sure you even know, Johnny, like the stories you work on that you care about, you know, they're probably better, right? Because you really care about them and you really care that they're, that they're gonna turn out well and you really care about the communities that you're covering in those stories. And so, I think that that is such an important part of it. And, and you know, often that is reduced to this idea of emotion, but it really is also, there. there's a practical angle to it too. So I remember when um, the shooting in Orlando happened, you know, I had a queer Puerto Rican young person on my team who we could fly to Orlando in the moment and he could he, he got so many great interviews that even the New York Times couldn't get. And, and part of that is because people felt comfortable talking to him. And so to me, it really is, you know, not just about kind of the emotion you might express, but also that like when you have a connection to a community, you're more likely to get better interviews. You're more likely to get, you know, better sourcing for those, for those stories. And so I think it's just a really important thing. And, and, I, and I think often the diversity conversation in newsrooms is, is always about this, like, oh, you know, their objective or quotas, or we need to bring certain numbers in. But I think there's actually a real business case for why you want diverse voices at the table, because that's the diversity of stories you're going to get. And that's, you know, going to help you keep your publication up to date. And um, yeah, so. So you call yourself a digital strategist um, on your LinkedIn. And I'm, I'm wondering if you maybe explain what exactly that means for those of us like myself who yeah. I, I'm not really that familiar with that term. So I, I'd, I'd love to hear about what, what that entails and how that maybe stems from or feeds into your work as a journalist. Yeah, I guess that is a really dated term now that you've asked me this question, Johnny. Thank you. <laughs> like, everyone's a digital strategist now. It's not, you know, that's that's probably for a holdover from 10 or 15 years ago when, you know, it was a really big appeal to uh, the older generation to be like, I understand the internet, guys. I can help you with this. Uh, <laughs> but um, so for many years before I worked in media, before I, Mike was actually my first job um, working as an editor uh where I was salaried as an editor. I had written articles before I had kind of worked at Feministing. Um, but between that, I uh, kind of used the skills that I had learned at Feministing to help different social causes with their digital strategies. And so um, I used to work with different kind of organizing groups um, such as or, or even big nonprofits like the ACLU and the SEIU to basically help them figure out how to get their messages to resonate and amplify online. Um, it is wild to think about how much things have changed in the 10 years since I started that work, um, both in how um, 
everything feels very amplified right now. So it's really hard to cut through the noise in a way that it wasn't as hard 10 years ago. Um, but, you know, basically that's, you know, it, it is a bit of a jargon for this, you know, support with like different causes and organizations on their online storytelling. Um, and that could be anything from, you know, your media coverage to, how do you get people on Facebook to care about a certain issue without using the horrible algorithms or fighting the algorithms in different ways, right? And so I think, and I think the stakes of digital strategy have changed um, in the in in the last in the last few years. Um, but that that's basically what it means. Yeah, it, it does feel like all all journalistic strategy has to necessarily take digital strategy into consideration yeah. nowadays because it's so integrated. Um, so you, you know, Jason was obviously mentioning this and you were talking at length about this. You write extensively about topics like, you know, from health and wellness, social justice, entertainment, politics. Would you, would you call yourself a culture writer or do you feel that that term is somehow lacking? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, you know, it's funny cause I, I think that most of the time I'm categorized as, a feminist and politics writer, even though I think Jason, you, you actually just wrote my bio for me. I, I think I think I do write about the politics of culture. Um, I, I you know because I, as much as I, I'm interested in culture, but I'm interested in what culture means to us as individuals on a identity and political basis. Um, and you know often what culture says about you know I mean like writing about Eddie Bryant, like writing about fat inclusivity, is less about just including fat people, but also how fat people are treated and how they're understood in the culture and what the political implications is to be a fat woman um, in a society that 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 denigrates and often hates fat bodies. And so, yeah, I, I would say that I'm, you know, I would say that I'm a politics writer in the kind of broadest sense of the politics writer. What I'm, what what draws me into things is really thinking about rep ideas of representation and identity. Um, I think this last week has been but nah, nah. like I would love to hear from all of you how you have felt about this Oscars slap story because this has been, well, this is the most I have felt disconnected from the discourse because I'm so confused about what everyone is talking about. It's been really wild. Um, but I, you know, even at that and even at these all these calls to be like, this isn't serious, let's not take it so seriously. I actually see some real rich political text here um, in terms of how people are responding to it and how they're dealing with it. And, and th those are the kinds of things that make me curious that that's that's what kind of interests me and you know a lot of your um a lot of your tweets i've noticed like even by twitter standards they are very short to the point you don't waste any time do you view twitter more as your personal sounding board or do you make every post with your journalistic work in mind and your poll in mind you know, I am really worried about Twitter. I'm really worried about the impact that it's happening on our minds and our ability to have conversation. Um, I don't encourage young journalists to join Twitter um, because I think that the impact it has on your ability to truly think creatively um, is far more dangerous to me than the possible exposure you can get from being on the platform. Um, and so my, so I went from tweeting a lot for many years. I've been on Twitter for like 15 years. I actually just got that, oh, um, uh, <laughs> that like, like I, I was there at South by Southwest in 2007 when it launched, I was one of the first people on it. Um, and it went from this kind of like personal networking have fun, joke around with people platform to a very serious and important tool for journalists, for sourcing, for up to the minute breaking news. Um, and now I feel like we've hit this other tipping point where there's just so many people on it and the risk is much higher than the reward for a viral tweet say. So, um, you know, it's, uh, so yeah, I think that I have a pretty apprehensive relationship to it, which is why my tweets are so short. I don't tweet very often. I probably tweet like once or twice a week. Um, and usually it's material that I'm working on. Like, it's not like, I almost like to see it as like, you know, I had an idea. It's not a full article. Let me just put it out there and see what happens. Um, and so I've, it's been, you know, I'm in the middle of writing a book right now and I had to I had to basically go off Twitter for like four months to even get like I had to stop worrying how people would respond to every single thing that I'm writing. And it's easy to easy to say that, but it's actually shockingly hard to do in an environment when you're constantly seeing people getting torn apart 
for the most innocuous ideas. Um, and so, yeah, it's my spiel on Twitter. And well, I, I, I hope you don't mind if I linger on the topic a little longer. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I did notice that you also have a check mark. You're verified. Um, yeah. it, I'm wondering because, you know, and I'm not, obviously not saying this is the case with you, but even like with some verified accounts, I've seen some pretty uh, heinous takes coming from <laughs> verified accounts. And I'm wondering, is the is the application process or whatever, like incredibly rigorous and also is, would you say there are some potential negative consequences for the like perceived legitimacy that that mm -hmm. verification on Twitter might confer? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, you know, the application process is not that rigorous, right? I mean, a lot of, I think that, so Twitter made a lot of deals with media companies. So a lot of editors are blue checks because they're considered legitimate uh, journalists, sources, editors. Um, but the standards for which those blue checks are kind of held to, as you rightfully point out, is really inconsistent. Like nobody at Twitter has ever contacted me to be like, this does not fall in line with your blue check status, right? Like it's not, it's kind of just a weird prestige badge. Um, I think I got it when I worked at Mike, all of the editors got it. Um, because I think we had a relationship with Twitter at the time. Um, and, you know, I think at the time it did help to be seen as a serious editor on the platform. I think at this point, I mean, it's, 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 I guess it's a sign of celebrity and on some level and that you're considered legitimate in the eyes of a team at Twitter. Um, but there's absolutely no transparency into, into what determines that um, and any standards around it. So, you know, I think that one of the, 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 um, consequences of that is, you know, disinformation, right? Like nobody fact checks on Twitter, anything could go viral. You have no idea, um, you know, what the, and, and, and Twitter has tried to do different things to stop disinformation from spreading. So um, one of them is there used, it used to be really easy to do a retweet and now there's like a one step process to retweet. And that's to basically stop think about what's in the tweet, really decide if you want to tweet it, retweet it, right? Or article links, it will ask you, are you sure you don't want to read the article first? You know, those kinds of things to basically stop that, you know, trigger moment when you just, um, but that doesn't mean that disinformation doesn't fly like wild or these kind of really like wild takes or, um, you know, things that do like fairly big reputational harm to people that then go viral, which like one side of that is, maybe that's great. And that's an opportunity for, you know, almost like a type of citizen journalism, a type of citizen accountability. Um, but often it feels like um, just kind of unregulated chaos to me, but yeah. So obviously you went into journalism for a reason. Um, much of your work deals with women's rights and the rights of people of color. So I'm wondering why did, why did you personally feel strongly enough about journalism that you decided to pursue it as a career? Mm -hmm. Um, so I, you know, I am a bit of an accidental journalist. I, um, I, I, you know, I started, I started with blogging and I don't think I ever really, I, I was PhD bound. I, I didn't think that I would become a journalist. Um, I didn't, yeah, it was not something I had a ton of exposure to. Um, and so I really came to a lot of this from my women's studies education, undergrad education. And um, there was the founder of Feministing, we went to undergrad together. Um, and so it was kind of, you know, a bit serendipitous. We um, stayed in touch over the years and then decided we wanted to kind of start this platform. And it really was um, through activism. Like I didn't, you know, I was really interested in how stories change people's minds about things and how, you know, when you hear somebody's story that's different from your own, it makes you more open-minded. It makes you, um, you know, more generous. And, 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 and there's just like a tremendous potential and possibility in what happens um, and, and specifically focused on kind of women's experiences and, um, you know, what would happen if we started a platform where women just honestly talked about their sexual assault experiences. And now we've seen what happens, right? It has the power to profoundly shift how we think about sexual assault in our culture. Um, and so that's really how I got into it. It was, it was, for me, it was a bit of a social justice mission driven thing. Um, and that led me to realizing, and, and, and this is, you know, it's, it's one of those things that I, one of the things I always tell people is like, don't, don't be afraid if like the first job you get out of college is not the exact thing that you always thought you wanted to do, because 
all of those different steps that I took, the years that I was a digital strategist, the years that I worked with organizers, grassroots organizers, the years that I, my first job out of college was singing on the Hudson River Clearwater, <laughs> Pete Seeger's boat, raising awareness wow. for, for <laughs> environmental education. And, um, uh, you know, I, and all of those things have actually led to, and now give me a tremendous amount of um, inspiration to think about stories and, and, and curiosity to think about stories. And I think that that's so much more important. I think that there's such a push to professionalize, um, young people in a way that does not allow for curiosity and creativity. And one thing I'm really grateful for that I can now say, looking back at all of the different things that I've done is they've all kind of helped and led to this moment where I can now sit back and like, I'm writing a book about my career and it's really different than what most people who end up as executive editor at Teen Vogue's career would look like. Um, but because of that, I bring a variety of experiences that I wouldn't otherwise have. And so I think, you know, journalism ended up being the right place for me to be. And like, I don't know if I'll stay there either. Like maybe I'll end up, you know, like I'm, I'm writing a memoir right now, which is kind of, you know, it's reported, but it's, 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 it's a new shift for me. It's, it's, an, it's a new kind of direction that I'm going in and maybe like that's the direction I'll go next. I think kind of staying open to that, um, that trajectory, I think was, was I'm, I'm grateful that I did that. So for my question, um, I noticed that you write quite a lot about feminism, culture, politics, and dating dilemmas, among other things. Obviously, this can, obviously these can take the form of like a very personal experience. So, like in your work, how do you how do you take how do you make this experience universal and more accessible for a wide range of readers? Mm. It's a great question um, because one of the big criticisms we got at Teen Vogue was that we were going to alienate we were gonna alienate um, all of the young people that aren't interested in these issues. And there, you know, if we write an explainer about how to talk about racism, you know, what about the people that don't wanna talk about racism that makes them uncomfortable? And so, and, and I think that that, you know, it's like both kind of funny and also like we, we had to really, we had to make a good case for it internally for how to, how, to, how do you kind of get people to care about issues that they don't necessarily care about, they may not have experiences with. Um, and one of the things that I have really learned in how I've told stories, and, and I think one of the biggest things I've learned is the difference between telling someone a story and showing them a story. Um, and, 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 and to me, there are, you know, like I really like to think about journalism as a type of, um, as, as a type of character development, as a type of writing where you, you know, whether I'm sharing my own stories or I'm sharing the stories of other people, um, that I bring humanity to those stories and I show qualities in them that are universal in ways that um, can resonate with a bigger audience. Um, and I think I, this was like many years ago, but Juno Diaz, I went to go see him speak after um, the brief wondrous life of Oscar Wow came out and something that he felt learned from that book, which um, was widely, wildly successful. Um, and um, he wrote for a very small group of people, but because he brought such passion and love and specificity to that group of people, um, it resonated with a bigger group of people. And that's something I've been thinking about a lot, which is, you know, being as honest, like what you don't want is overly generic work that you, in the effort to relate to people. But if you relate to the people that you understand can can ex like understand that experience and you do that in a really kind of authentic and deep way, that will actually resonate to a, a broader audience. And, 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 you know, one of the things that I always say is like, don't talk down to your audience. Don't assume that they're not going to understand things um, when you do speak from a place of authority or authenticity or um, from from compassion. Hi, my question is, um, when first starting out in media, what is one piece of advice you wish you heard sooner or have valued the most throughout your career? No, now you got me. <laughs> this is a good question. This is, I'm, I'm, I'm writing a book about my career. So a lot of this mm -hmm. is, is top of mind. I think that, so one of the hardest things about media is it's it's made up of elites <laughs> and when you don't come from an elite background so like all of you you are CUNY students I went to a SUNY school I went to SUNY Albany 
um, New York State represent always. And um, let's just say that, you know, the upper echelons of media are, uh, you know, from the most elite universities. And sometimes that made me feel really insecure. It made me feel a little bit on the outside looking in. Um, and I think that I, knowing what I know now and realizing they actually needed me more than I needed them, um, because they were so inside a bubble that they did not have enough people that had my experiences kind of working amongst them to, to have faith and confidence in what I was doing. Um, and I know that's like easy to just be confident in what you say and what you do. Like, obviously it, it you know, it takes time to develop that. Um, but I think there were times when I didn't always trust my own instincts, um, because I was just afraid from, what was around me and 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 as though there was like a secret language people were speaking that I didn't understand. Um, and, and I think that that was one of the things that I have seen over and over again is that there is something there. Like nobody can say and write the thing that you can say and write the way that you can do it. And there is a value in that. Um, and, and it's often when we start to imitate other people or um, we, we, we lose that kind of that, that connection to, to our own story or to our own kind of authentic perspective, um, that, that you often start to lose your way. Um, but yeah, I would say that's probably my biggest lesson. Uh, thank you again for speaking with us and for giving, um, just like your own experience. Um, there was one thing that you mentioned about talking with regards to Twitter and how it can actually like stifle creativity. And I was wondering if you could speak more to that as well as also describe like what personally gives you inspiration or your own creativity, just because like with me, um, like social media is something that I definitely want to do in order to like elevate my own platform. So can you like speak a little bit more about, you, about what you said about Twitter and also just like your own source for inspiration and yeah. creativity? Yeah. Um, so I, it's the thing with creativity, and this is why I've become a little bit more uh, you know, if you heard me speak 10 years ago, I was the most techno optimistic person you would have ever met. Like, and, and I still am in the sense that I do think that the internet, you know, a lot of these tools elevate voices that are historically left out of many of these spaces. And so, you know, I have absolutely found journalists through social media by following them on social media and deciding that I want to assign them stories. So I don't want to say that it's easy for me to say with a, uh, as a blue check Twitter person that I'm like, I don't like it anymore. It's like, I already, I, I have a book deal. Like I, I don't, I don't have to tweet anymore <laughs> on some level, you know, and, and, and I don't think we can say that for every young person. So I, I, I wouldn't say that you don't, have to use it at all. But I do think that we are going to have to have a come to Jesus pretty soon within journalism about the role that social media has played. And, and people have been, people have been ringing the alarm, you know, after the election of Trump and the, the spread of disinformation on Facebook, we understand, you know, we need to be reporting on these platforms as much as we're using these platforms to do our own reporting, right? And holding, holding Twitter accountable and holding Facebook accountable and like TikTok, talk about, you know, a mysterious company that we don't know what they're doing with our data. I mean, it's a hot mess, right? And so there's a lot of considerations, I think, in just what it means to be a citizen of these kind of platforms and, and, and how to use them. Um, and I would say that, you know, something that I've just started to realize is like, when you're creating something, it's fragile, right? It's fragile. And it shouldn't always be the, you know, privy to the public eye. It shouldn't, th there are moments when you need to protect yourself and you need to give yourself space and almost create a bubble to be able to do some really deep thinking or to really figure something out. And it's very hard not to let reading other people's work at such a high rate impact what your own opinion is gonna be. And so I think it's really important to like go, like, yes, when you're thinking about what a story should be and you're doing research for it, absolutely. Use Twitter, use social media. But when you're sitting down and putting words on paper, that needs to be you and, and, and the words. Like, I don't, I, I think it's really important to kind of protect yourself from, you know, other people's ideas and thoughts in those moments. Um, and I also am a big advocate of the group text. I have a lot of close friends who I send things to, to read and gut check for me so that I don't have to go out onto Twitter and find out the hard way that my take was off. And like, we're all gonna have off takes, right? We're, we're, we're not perfect. Like we're all, we're human. We're always gonna be kind of brainstorming and, and, and trying to think through ideas. And, um, and, and this is something that I've, um, 
I've learned from experience is I don't think I even realized how much doing so much work in the public was impacting the work itself um, uh, until I, I just came back from a six week residency um, where I didn't have internet access in my cabin. <laughs> and it was really hard, really, really hard. Um, but it was a profound experience for my book. There are things that came out through that process that I don't think would have happened if I was scrolling on Twitter and Instagram all day. Hi, thank you so much for being here. Honestly, the minute you said um, Will Smith and Chris Rock, I was like alarm bells went off in my head and I was like, I have a million and one questions. But <laughs> that just made me think about a lot of the things that um, I'm even thinking about as like a young you know, person trying to go into journalism and it's this oversaturation of information all the time. But then on top of that, there's this sensitivity to information. You know, everyone seems to be having a very, very strong opinion on something all the time. And you brought up cancel culture. You know, as a journalist, you're relatively writing for a young audience. So how do you handle this upcoming sort of culture that we're seeing right now with how we handle information? But then how is this being received within mm -hmm. the journalism world too? Like, is there talk between journalists of like, mm -hmm. you know, warning one another, of, don't say this, don't say that. Or is there more like a push to be more honest now more than ever? No, I don't, I don't think there's a push to be more honest. I think that many of these platforms are privy to, the, to traffic goals. And so I felt so grateful that I didn't have to get up and run a brainstorm on the Oscars on Monday, mm -hmm. knowing that we ha would have to write something about Will Smith and Chris Rock because that would be the highest traffic story for the day. Um, and, 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 and that is, you know, from the editor side, that has been one of the biggest challenges um, is knowing that balance of, you know, understanding that like, whether we wanted it to be or not, that was news and, and, and we would have to address it in some way. And, but also the stakes are so high in how you address it. Like, I don't know if you guys saw like Zoe Kravitz said something. And so like, she's been getting dragged for the last few days. Um, people are pulling out evidence that she's a pedophile or something. Like it's, it's really, really, really dark times. And, um, I think that one of the hardest, I would say one of the hardest things in running a newsroom was how much that culture was impacting my journalists, how much they were having a hard time separating what they should say with what they wanted to say or what the window of what was socially acceptable. And, and even as I'm saying all this, I want to add caveats because a Republican would have a field day with this. Like they'd be like, that's what we're talking about. You overly liberal college students that have ruined public discourse. That's not the issue to me. <laughs> like, I still think racism is bad. That's not up for debate. I still think sexism is bad, not up for debate. <laughs> so, you know, I, it's not that, but it is um, like, I don't feel comfortable expressing an opinion on what happened on Sunday after reading what's happened in the last three days. I've learned that it's not really my place to have an opinion about it. Um, but as a media maker, of course I have an opinion, but as a human being, I have an opinion about it, you know? And so I, I think this, and I felt this very much after the invasion of Ukraine, um, is that we would do well to, to, to listen as much as we feel the need to have an opinion. And um, it's better to not have an opinion than have an uninformed opinion. Um, and so while there is this pressure to kind of get into it and like compete with everybody on the take, um, the more thoughtful take is actually the one that's gonna resonate the most. And so um, I don't know if anybody read the piece by Wesley Morris in the New York Times about the slap, like that was really powerful. And I think that, you know, identifying certain writers like Roxane Gay wrote a really powerful piece about the defense, in defense of like, not justifying the slap, but in defense of being sensitive and in defense of thin skin, um, you know, and and I, I, like, I'm really starting to to try to use to, to step back and really read the journalists and the columnists that I think have something interesting to say rather than a thousand opinions from like self-proclaimed pundits on, on Twitter. Um, and, 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 and I wait to chime in on things that are either low stakes enough that I don't feel a ton of pressure of tweeting about it or, um, or, or I don't end up saying anything at all. And, and the other thing is like, it's important to realize like social media is a type of labor too. So if no one's paying you to do your tweets, like, like I, I have felt this a lot, you know, it's like, of course my agent would love for me to tweet day in and day out and constantly be at the center of all this controversy and get my name out there. 
someone could pay me to do that if they if they really because that that is a form of labor it's an emotional labor it's it literally takes time I have to do research to do it and so I am always you know apprehensive to do that labor for free whereas I could save those notes or save those ideas I have an ongoing notes document of like would-be tweets that I don't tweet that I just keep as possible things that I could use in stories down the road um and and you know maybe one day it'll come out in a book or one day it'll come out in an article so you don't you shouldn't feel like even if the internet it makes you feel like you need to respond right away you should not feel like you have to my other question is on behalf of the students and it's really we hear a ton about a push toward inclusivity in media in general and newsrooms in particular and the question is i guess two parts one how real is it and two if it's real, how do Queens College students find opportunities and take advantage of this push to, to get themselves into these positions that have so long gone to people from more elite backgrounds? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so how real is it? I would say it really depends on the outlet. So I, I, think, I think it's real. I, I, th I think that there is an understanding in most progressive media outlets that diversity makes your outlet better. Like, I, I think people realize that they understand it. What brought them there, that's their business. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was, uh, you know, maybe it was the George Floyd protests. Maybe they understood it before, maybe they didn't. Um, so, so I do think that there's an interest and I think that there is, what, what there isn't an interest for is a recognition of class difference within the media industry. Mm -hmm. and, and that is something that I have, that I realized after working at a place like Condé Nast. And, and I think that there is, you know, there is this kind of like left push, like the Jacobins, these kind of, you know, online spaces, but to actually hire people from truly diverse backgrounds, working class backgrounds in New York, I don't see, I don't, I don't see an effort for that. Mm -hmm. um, but, but that said, I also think that depending on what your issues are and what you're interested in reporting on, um, you know, there's so much incredible momentum happening just within New York, right? Like the taxi issue. I mean, that strike that happened, the hunger strike that those, that was not even in all the major publications about New York, right? Like New Yorker didn't cover it. New York Magazine didn't cover it. And so those stories are there and there is an interest for those stories. So I think finding out the publications that are interested in those kinds of stories also is really helpful um, and to be pitching those stories to them. There's different fellowships. Um, I think City Lab is one that comes to mind of people that are reporting on communities in Queens, in Brooklyn, um, and, and kind of, so I think that one of the things I'm really interested in is this push to going local. And so, you know, if you wanna be a digital writer at a Buzzfeed, yes, like that is one path. You know, I think that, you know, if you wanna do takes, you wanna do that, that is one path. Um, but then I think there's also, there is an interest in local journalism again and um, writing for more local outlets and finding those opportunities and making those relationships, finding journalists in your neighborhood, in your area that have kind of covered the issues that you're interested in. And so, so yeah, I guess that's a long-winded way of saying yes and no. <laughs> I would say there's an interest in it. Um, and, and it would really depend on you know, again, I think that digital journalism is going to have to have a big reckoning soon um, because the financial models are not working um, and they like writers are not paid what they should be paid for the amount of work that they're expected to do. Um, and so to be wary of that, that said, there are a lot of outlets and there are opportunities to write for those. And so you have to balance exposure with exploitation, for lack of a better word. I want to thank you, Samita. This has been amazing. Um, I really think the students have benefited from it hugely. And I just want to express gratitude on behalf of Queens College, on behalf of the Night News, on behalf of the Queens Podcast Lab, and say that you were brilliant today and it was fantastic to interact with you. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for all the work you all do. Um, both at the university and as professors there. Um, thank you.